Um, particularly that led to how the mood, this this level of stand from out of here, the, the direct action began. And it has to do with ritual. Okay, we go start. Aloha. Aloha. Okay, so so a mahalo to you for coming and joining me. We we found we work great together. We were good. They sent us to Maui and we just like we can bounce off each other. So I actually wanted I was excited that she wanted to come and, and hear this to and be part because um so T. So as I go through the story, just jump in. Okay. You haven't heard any story either, but the idea of what um, I want to explain today is this concept of of ritual, of creating ritual. Um, sometimes planned, sometimes very unplanned, but actually observing this concept of ritual. Because you know, every single peoples in the world have ritual. Every culture has some form of ritual. Mind you, ritual just means habit, right? Means you wake up, wash your face, brush your teeth, comb your hair, change clothes, eat, go to school, go work. That's ritual. It's habitual um, and common. It, it's habitual and common practice on the mundane level, but that's the same way that we build ritual. Repetition. Whether they be our our everyday cognizant. And, or even greater ritual cycles, maintaining ceremonies at a particular time, making sure to always, before you go in the ocean, you always go in kahia first. Before you go in the forest, you always kahia, or you always, some, that's always a ritual. That's something you always conduct. Sometimes we've, it's been so intergenerational that we don't even realize it's a ritual. So we analyze, oh wow. We all take our slippers off before going in the house. That's almost ritualistic here. You bring somebody, uh, um, you bring someone food, nourishment, some kind of gift, you go and visit. Even if something as simple as a hooey before you enter the house and not just bust through the door. That's protocol. That's ritual. And so in that, um, one of the things that we're facing in this particular step, and when it comes to the whole question of the sacredness of Mauna Kea, one thing that we're up against is a system that deems ritual and Hawaiian culture of only existing within a particular timeline. And anything after a particular timeline, they will tell us Hawaiians straight to our face, that's not a Hawaiian practice. Because apparently there's a cutoff date to be Hawaiian. Apparently there's an expiration date yeah. to our practitionership. Yeah. Huh. Nice and, to me. and that is a, that's a system. That was designed because well, we are still living in the, the design system of genocide, of annihilation. They did not expect us to still be here. They systematically set up these things that would breed us out of existence. The, the banning of our language. We're not supposed to be speaking Hawaiian by this time. They tried to ensure that that would be dead and gone. That our spirituality and connection and our, our religion of, of our kupuna, that's supposed to be gone by now. So we're really screwing them up, which is great. But in that too, it's um, the, the concept that ritual is something that is, uh, can be both perpetual and also has to have origin, starting points. And rituals, um, you know, we, we create different rituals when we need a, a specific to a need. You know, when, when something is needed, we will create a, a, a routine a ritual to make sure that whatever is needed can take place. Okay? So, so, I'm going to take you on this long journey. Ready? ready? So, as I've shared, I'm, I'm, I graduated from Kanoka Aina, which is a Hawaii, uh, the, it was the very first Native Hawaiian public charter school. Kanoka Aina and the charter school movement emerged out of these summer programs that originated in Waitio. Um, it was started by yeah, all these practitioners coming together and wanted to create a space to immerse keiki in cultural learning. Started with their kids, with us. My mother, guys, well, summer fun wasn't enough. 
Oumaka Ika'i making on Ikuheke Ole and singing about it, it wasn't enough at Kamehameha schools. For, that wasn't enough. And they needed a place, they needed um, uh, to facilitate a space in which their children and their children's children and the children's um, contemporaries, our classmates and our communities, had a place to nurture that nurture the practitioner aspect so that whatever our parents and grandparents had to relearn became second nature to us. That's the whole point, right? That's why we dream all of this. And out of that came um, came Kanwoka Island. So from origin, we're originating from YPO, which first began, it began to expand, and so you had Kukurukumohana Opuna, Oka'u, Ohana, with these different um, Hui's forming up. And they helped to set that precedence for a lot of us young ones. Um, that's where I learned Naaumakua with Uncle Kia. And he was so mean. I love him. <laughs> we were not allowed to go to sleep that final. Like the fifth night of camp is like, if you don't have Naaumakua, you're not allowed to go to sleep. I was one of the ones stuck up to one o'clock in the morning. You have to go to Uncle, and he's just sitting with his lamp going over there. And crack. Yeah. And you got to go out and recite it. You mess up, up, go. Go back over there for 20 more minutes, go practice some more. An old school discipline. Deconstructing. Yes. That entire, the, the beginning of it, of Kukuluku Mohana into what would be the mo charter school movement, the, the uh, culture and public charter school movement, was, was an act of defiance it, of the intellect. The the idea of of taking your keiki and immersing them in themselves, in in their genetic history, in their in their ancestral memory, so, similar to some of you who just sometimes maybe maybe you had an opinion about this, maybe you didn't, but sometimes all it took was standing here and being here on the mountain. But easy yeah, to get a little um, distracted and insecure when you're away. And so in similarly, um, the, the entire program was based on the idea that we would begin to deconstruct all of that colonial mentality from our kids so that they would have the sovereignty of, of mind. This, politics, social political structures, Aina, we can <coughs> laws, we can fight that. We, we there's a face to them, but this is the final frontier. This is the this is the space, and this is the space. Your naaw, your intuition, and your intellect are the spaces that colonization did the most irreparable damage to. And it usually takes two to three times longer for and multiple generations of a of a native population to be able to suss that out. So that's what the Kano Kaina and um, Kukuluku Mohana were born. It was called Kukuluku Mohana. It was to restore to Kukulu, to restore that sense of um, uh, that that ideology, Kumuhana, philosophy, Kumuhana, to kids. We were the investment, the first investment group, and obviously it worked. <laughs> yeah, and so I I first attended Kukuru Kumohana, I think it was 1999. Oh my god. No, no, it was earlier than that. I don't remember really. It was earlier than that. Yeah, yeah, I, I did, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was earlier than that. Um, because, uh, yeah, it had to have been. Because that was like fourth grade. I don't even know. But um, fourth grade, my first summer that I went. Um, and after, and then every summer I kept going. I had, had one summer, I actually did Kukurukumohano Kaliopuweo, Kukurukumohano O Mokuai, and Kukurukumohano O Puna. I was gone all summer, my mom was just happy. <laughs> Slap them off, let me go. Um, and um, so, again, so this burst into the becoming the, uh, the vision. I remember hearing Auntie Kuz, um, as I quote her, she, when she was talking about the vision of the charter schools. Was that because also observing predominantly a lot of Kanaka Maori kids in these environments, we were excelling. 
Like it was amazing to see us being able to memorize these pages of chants and be working the aina and learning all these things in this time. It was a month back when I was younger. Whole we months in my tail. For the whole, live the whole month. The whole month. You know work, you know eat. That kind. Love it. Kids. Kids yeah. doing the heavy hitting. Walk it was amazing. Yeah. Good fun. Yeah. Good fun. Oh, when they make you walk in the dark. From the from the beach in YTO, all the way for about two miles down the road in the dock. In hey, the, your in eyes the come strong. Yeah. You hold each other, and your relationships come real strong, and you sing real loud. So, but from that birth, uh, remember Anziku saying, you know, Seeing where we, as Kanaka Maori children, are thriving, why then would we want to send our children back to the belly of the beast? Because a lot of us, I myself, we were all a derelicts in the regular system. We were I the ones not eight. functioning to our potential. Yeah. I was a sped kid. I'm ADHD. All the learning deficit kind of analogies, or not, not analogies, or, or terminologies that they want to slap on everyone that doesn't fit into their square. To the fact that even some of our own people agree to the disgusting concept of drugging our children to fit into their box. That's messed up. That's but we accept resistance. those. Somehow we've accepted. We've normalized the, these um, these acronyms for conditions that we that simply means. The indigenous ancestral memory and, and inherent and innate abilities and skill sets of our of our keiki aren't being met with the current with the current educational um, structure because it isn't meant for us. You know, talk about a talk about a um, a square peg in a round hole, and so. The, then what do you do? So it, it was out of it was born out of the concern of parents, um, of fellow parents who happen to be educators, who said, "Okay, we cannot, we just gotta stop diagnosing our children and developing their potential." So. Um it's from these summer camps led by that vision of not wanting to send our kids back into a system that does not work for us. And uh, they began, first started off with the Hawaiian Academy, which was a high school program, uh, which was a, a school within, within a, a school, school at Honoka'a High School. I always go talk about Honoka'a, the frame from. And we are always the stepping stools to things, but we always get it forgotten. So I always go talk about story, like, you know, don't forget. It's a tiny little town over there that would help a lot of this stuff. Don't forget us. Um, but that's where it began as Hawaiian Academy for a number of years. Again, it was just high school. I wasn't old enough to attend, but my sister was in it. And they, that galvanized to the point where in the year 2000, they finally reached out and became their, the very first Native Hawaiian public charter school. But they ended up moving to Waimea, but getting funding over them. So Waimea is where it established itself. But in 2000, so that's where I had to make the decision to leave my hometown, where I was from Hanabara kindergarten days, preschool, all the way to eighth grade, and I had to say goodbye to my friends, and I made the decision to go to Waimea uh, for Kanu. And, you know, ritual in Kukurukumohana, one of the simple rituals, we wake up before the sun. You greet that sun. So we were introduced at very young. Kano Kaina. We open up our days with pulling, with, with protocol. We end our day with protocol. That's ritual. So these oh. little rituals that are building up help compile this as we go through the story. And um, don't get weirded out about the word ritual. Ritual, protocol, ceremony, people get real um shakalaka about it. It's not. <laughs> All of spirituality is based on a very, very clear and fine balance of sacred and secular, of profound and profane. Because we're Kanaka, we cannot help it. We're, we're humans. So we're bound to, at some point, 
um, uh, act upon those those human instincts of self preservation of ego of heliocentrism that's the when i'm the center of the universe and everything revolves around me that's what heliocentrism means mm. so ritual means one part it has to be practical equally as practical as it is profound that's why when we talk to you guys and i speak plainly or in pigeon or with a with with some kind of humor it's to make that palpable, to, to allow you to absorb that in and something that's familiar. So know that the practical application or aspect of any ritual is the relationship of you and your environment. It informs that. That's, that's it. That's the spirit part. The spirit part is your actual, is your, um, is your commitment to that relationship. And maintaining it. And the maintenance is said ritual. That's how you make them. Always has to have a practical application. Why you know why you know whistle at night or like, you know, superstition comes out of misinformation. Or when there is a void of information, then the human uh, the human need to fill in the that void with um with with misinformation tends to happen so all of this that we uh, we're trying to impart and we're trying to enforce as far as ritual is concerned is very practical practical application like that's the most critical thing that i love about our culture it always comes down down to the very that's right Practical application, the Keiki asks us, how can we how can we better be better aloha aina? Start with picking up the rubbish on your campus. The fact where it, ah. when you are still walking by Opala and your brain goes, who did that? Opposed to just picking it up, then we still got work to do. As opposed to do that. Yeah. Since That's when that, since when did your subconscious and your your conscious mind say who how come that's somebody else's responsibility? Instead of asking yourself the question, why haven't I already picked it up? That's ritual. Ritual helps to take the focus off of uh, off of um, our human needs and onto environment. So from here now, so the Kano, I only started Kano Kaina in ninth grade. I was already in high school. So I only had like four years of Kano. I graduated in 2004, but I actually on my senior year, um, this new program uh, reached out to our school um, for student participants. It was called the Native Youth Cultural Exchange Program. It was being spearheaded um, by a Pit River tribe, uh, by a man by the name of Jonathan Freeman. Um, who is married to a Kanaka woman, uh, uh, um, and through a, a series of different events, brought him to create this culture exchange program. So Jonathan, he's Choctaw Chichimeca. So his people are actually from like down South Florida area. But he's been kind of uh, Hanai or adopted into the Pit River Nation, which is in Northern California, Mount Shasta area. He had an uncle, and he's married to a Hawaiian woman who he met up there. And he has an uncle that he wanted to go visit who is, um, well, he's actually like Mexican Indian, Mayan, I think. But he was living in Hopi, Arizona. So they go down to visit him in Hopi, and at the time that they're visiting there, they're, they find out and they hear there's a whole group of charter school kids from Hawaii coming to visit the village that they were happened to be in with a Mayan uncle, him and his Hawaiian wife, the Choctaw Chichi Mecca guy from California. They happened to be Hopi. And when they say all these buses pulled up and all these Hawaiian charter school kids came out 
and they began their 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 kaya. And um, the, sort of the series of events that they were the ones who, who found themselves there to greet them. It was supposed to be a different family that was supposed to greet them. Last minute they couldn't be there, so they reached out to the uncle, and so they all found themselves there with all these Kanaka kids doing this pule. And they remember the old so'o, or the grandma of the area, she stepped forward and told them, welcome home. All these Kanaka, welcome home. And, you know, in conversation, at Tiku, Kakala was actually at, at that gathering, and um, uh, he was, Jonathan was sharing about their community, River Nation, you know, they're, they're, um, they don't have, they, they're condensed down so small now, they don't even have reservation yet, what they call rancherias, a different process. Um, and he was sharing how they're very isolated up there, their, their youth don't have a lot of contact or communication with other indigenous youth and such. And he was sharing that when he was in Hopi with his uncle, and his uncle was saying, oh yeah, stay a lot of the youth here in Hopi, you know, they're very isolated, they don't have a lot of access and with other youth, indigenous youth. And then all these Kanaka show up, and they're talking to Auntie, and Auntie says, oh yeah, you know, a lot of our kids, you know, we're very isolated, we don't have a lot of contact with other, just like, oh, that's right there. And it's out of that, that gathering, that Jonathan decides to create this cultural exchange program. And um, I remember having to do the whole process, you had to write an essay, and da 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 da. And I was one of, out of four young Hawaiian kids who were selected to go and represent Hawaii in this cultural exchange. And there was one alaka'i, one uh, mapua to come with us, and it was predict predominantly a uh, young men's leadership program. And so they had one mapua to come with us, and actually, I've been so happy to see, was Uncle Calvin Ho. Oh, hey, Uncle Cal. Yeah. Uncle Calvin came with us. Um, and there was just four of us. There's three brothers from Oahu and then myself from Big Island. And it was a month-long exchange. And so how it was was we were going to go to different places. So we all went up to Hopi. It is dry. That's kind of because it was, it was calling us fish. Did you guys a fish out of water? We're like, oh, my God. First thing we had for two was like, Eye drops, lip balm, nose spray, lotion, with the like, prunes. But it was such a powerful experience, you know, being in the, on the reservation there. Um, and, you know, so throughout this exchange, something was very interesting. So, just, you know, the whole Ilona, how things line up. We happened to be there the same time as the peace and dignity runners were coming through Hopi. So, there was a young woman here a few days ago. She talked about the eagle and the condor. Does anybody hear that? Mm -hmm. her, her dream? Yeah. I was like, Ooh! So, the eagle and the condor on the Mokuhonu, on, on the continents, um, the eagle is representative of a lot of the North American tribes. Yeah? Um, and the condor the is the South American tribes. And this unification, this run that they call the Peace and Dignity Run, I think it happens once every four years or something. But it's, a, it's about bringing the people back together. And so all these North American tribes, they actually began running way up in Alaska. And they run down through North America. And there's other, all these South American tribes start all the way down in Argentina. And they run all the way up through South America. And they will meet at the Panama Canal where the lands were severed. Yeah. But we just so happened to be in Hopi the same time as these runners were coming through Hopi. And these guys run for like three months. It's a long journey, like relay style. Okay? Um, and they welcomed us to run with them. So I was okay. I never, you know, I ran as a kid, but you know, not that kind of run. And then this concept of ceremonial running, I was okay. What was very powerful, one thing when we were greeted there, there were people from many different tribes. These are many different peoples. But they all coming together to pray. And when the sun rose in Monkapi village that morning, we went off our pule, the Mashika went off our pule, the Hopi, just everyone offering their pule. Then they took us inside. And they opened up all these blankets. And these blankets were filled with all these different prayer staffs from all these different nations. They all sent these prayer staffs. And so how they begin their run that day, everybody chooses a staff 
to run with that day. And I grabbed this small, humble staff. I, I feel bad that I don't remember exactly what tribe it was from. But just to honor them and carry them. And how they do it, they do a style where they call pinching the earth. The main thing is that the, throughout the whole journey, all the land that they traverse has to be covered with pule. So not quite really. They, they drop everybody off in intervals, and you have to cover that section. They drop it, drive ahead, and keep just going like that, going like that. Okay, this is Hopi. You know familiar with Hopi? It's high mesa deserts. I was like, yeah, I can do a mile. <laughs> Easy. Okay, it's high elevation. It's like running up here. It's like six, 7,000 feet of mesas. But hot. And I remember running. <laughs> I swear I could hear my brain boiling in my head. And the van is over there. I'm like, that was the first one, just, just like getting kind of cocky kid, but oh my. But um, there was something they said, you okay? Good, suck some water, we're going to drop you off again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, said, I forgot, actually, very beautiful. When we all selected our staffs, the first thing we do is we run, the first little leg is everybody runs out together. And we had to run down through Monkapi village. And the sun was just finished rising, just puffed up. And as we ran down through the village, we came out and the road was white. In Hopi, they, they pray uh, with what they call homa, which is cornmeal from the white corn, the sacred corn. The elders were all out there. And they had thrown the homa. The whole road was white with homa. And as we ran, you know, just the concept of thing, you know, think about this. You have people that just came into your space. They are not of your people, but they've come and they're offering prayers for your people nonetheless. And these elders were up before the sunrise to lay down prayers. And as we ran, we heard their calls and their prayers. Just echoing to them. It was so like, whoa. It was so empowering. I was thinking, okay, we did like a marathon runner. Come around the corner. Whoa. It totally sets you into a different, different mindset. And then you're running with these guys. Some of these guys have been running for like a month already. And you're like, run hard, brother. Keep your prayers strong. It's like, okay. So your mind that can't just wander off. You're starting to feel that, whew, that drive of the body. You're starting to feel that exertion. And then into every step, you're planting that prayer. Okay? Learning this ritual. And so we carried on throughout that whole day. I think that day we covered like 70 miles. And um, it was very powerful. We just joined them for that one day. Uh, and they were going to continue. And then we ended up going up to Northern California, uh, Mount Shasta, to another run. The Pit River Nation, they have a ceremony called, they call it the Ancestral Run. And the Ancestral Run, they run between their two sacred mountains, from Ya'aku to Atichina. Ya'aku is Mount Shasta. Atichina is Mount Lassen. Um, and they, they do this ceremony every year. And they had shared with us that they're running and praying for the health of their people and for the land. Uh, the ancestral run, they're calling and honoring their ancestors. And they're traversing, uh, rooted to a mo'olelo of their people, a creation story. Um, the story speaks of um, a little dispute between the mountain lion and the bear. Say, when the earth was still young, when it was brand new, it was still soft. Um, and, but the bear and the uh, mountain lion were arguing of who was stronger, yeah. who was the more powerful. And so they went to the creator, and so uh, um, Ya'aku is their Mauna Kea. That's their sacred place. For them, after creation, the, the creator sits at Ya'aku. And so the mountain lion and the bear, they go to speak to the creator and ask, no, which one of us did you make stronger? Because you know what, uh, we'd like to have a race. The first of you to reach Atichina will be, will be the, the more powerful. And so they began their race, and these two massive beasts, they began their run. You see the bear, he was so big, so powerful. With each step, he sunk deep into the mud. And each step he took, he just carved out the earth, just bumbling through. And the mountain lion was so swift, so slick, though, that he was slipping and sliding and pushing up the mud and pushing up the earth, all these places. So these two kind of bumbling beasts... They make their way all the way across, and they both reach uh, Atichina at the same time. And so the creator 
elevated the both of them as equal power. But he gave the bear the day sky and the mountain lion the night sky. But what was left behind between these two mountains is Pit River country. The Isawi. And it's all valleys and gorges and everything. And that's how their land was shaped from the mountain lion and the bear. And so that's the trek that their run takes. So it's a very powerful thing. And that one too, like everybody comes out. You had elders, you had children, you had everybody. And we all, everybody just goes out and they, they rug it. They rug it out there. We ended up, because we came from far and so we ended up pulling into camp. It was already late after night and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we got these Hawaiians and everybody and these, you know, these Hopi. And they're like, right on. Find a spot to sleep. Get some sleep. That's it. That's our introduction. Oh, where's the tent site? <laughs> no, they just try to sleep back and uh, sleep back on the ground and go sleep. Oh, rocky, eh? mm. Well, before that, they go tell us all these stories about like you know, uh, the bears, mountain lions, snakes, Bigfoot. <laughs> Bigfoot is totally part of their culture there. That is, he's integral. So, of course, I don't like sleep out there because the line up is getting farther and farther away from the light. I'm like, screw that, I get out of the way, I like, sleep in the middle. Would be but, me uh, to get hit up by big foot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with my turn. Huh? That's another real interesting story about the, uh, the, the more than big foot. He's a protector. They have a fear. Yeah. It is a fear and a respect to the big foot. Yeah? But that's a different story. But um, we woke up the next morning and the ritual was simple. They really, the rituals come very much is around the sacred fire. And so they wake up the next morning and they, we did the prayers and we just, you know, us kind of, we just, just follow, just search them out and follow, follow the natives. And they do theirs a little bit different than the other guys. They, they actually drop everybody off. They have their, their one prayer staff and they run it. And they drop everybody off at intervals and you run it to the next person and they pass it on. It's like a relay and it just keeps going and then the cars will pick up from the back and take you ahead. And we're not running the main highways. You run through these beautiful old off-roads. So we're going in and up, up and down to these valleys and mountains along the lakes and the rivers. It's beautiful. It was so powerful. And you, sometimes you get dropped off and you're stuck there for like two hours waiting. You know how far back the staff is, depending on how many people. But you get dropped off with different people so you end up getting to know each other and sometimes you're dropped off by yourself and you just get into observe, you being in the spot, you know. Think about like how much places we, we just drive past it. We all know it because we drove past it our whole life, but have you ever actually stopped and looked around there? And so that was something to be in these places and not just drive by, but spend some time hanging out in that aina. So it's very interesting and, and learning and, and telling the stories and hearing from the elders. And it's a two-day run. We run all the way to a certain point. They have ceremonies and prayers, and then we finish the run at, at Mount Shasta the next day. But it's a powerful thing. There are ceremonies at either end as well, adding to the ceremony of the run. They have the sweats, they have the bear dances, there's other things that they do. And it was very, very powerful as a young Kanaka to be experiencing this. You know, this to be in the community of other indigenous people. And what they already recognize in parallels, you know, very different in, in, in practice, but the core and the function is very much the same as what we do. This connectivity and this respect and call to Aina, to land, to earth, that earth is family. And we are the young ones. Okay? And we respect the grandfather, the grandmother. But that term applies to the animals, the plants, uh, the earth, the mountains. You know? So we find all these parallels. So for a number of years, I re I've returned to this run. Um, I actually became a director of that program, and I, I helped to bring students uh, from Hawaii. And, and we kept doing this program for a while, and then... Ran out of money, so had a big gap. But then we were able to get some funds together and we were able to do the program again in 2013. 2013, every return, I have a small group of, of Kanaka boys I took up. We did Hopi. Actually, we started in Hawaii. They all came down here to Hawaii. We actually stayed at Kuala Kala Charter School. That's the Kuala Kala. Mm -hmm. um, and then we all went. We actually brought them up here to Mauna Kea. At this time, 2013, TMT is already starting to make its movements around here in our community. I know this is already a time where we've been supporting a number of those who were petitioning against it. And to pull cases uh, from my community where after I got more involved via her. Um, 
supporting them, and we brought them into the Mauna. We took those boys up to Lake Waiau. They helped to lay their prayers here. We heard of what our strife and our battle here. And then we, our time we went to Hopi, did a lot of work on Hopi, connected with the people, and then we had to drive all the way up to Northern California. We took them back to the run, sharing with those boys, yeah, you guys got to this, this. But this day, this time, I was hanging out, and one of the, one of the, the leaders of, of, of the tribe up there and of this run is Uncle Radley Davis. And Uncle Radley, um, that's in Joe, uh, he was talking with somebody and he was telling, yeah, you remember when we started this like 20 years ago? I was like, the what? I thought this was one ancient ceremony. This whole time, all these years I was there, I thought this was an ancient ceremony that they are, you know, because... You know, as far as I know, it's also ancient. That's partly true. Um, Mesoamerica, especially, um, when you're dealing with the southern, uh, the southern uh, of the Americas, the middle, so from Mexico and the, even the south, the southern um, states, the southern United States, into Meso uh, Mexico, so the Aztec, the Maya, and the Inca, they all have a similar um, in, um, older tradition of of uh, ceremonial running or ritual running. Um, and usually it borders um, the territory or the, the area of one per where one particular um, uh, people indigenous to that place uh, recognizes. And the, the essential, essentially it's to reaffirm their connection to every single corner and every single um, expansive part of their aina. That's really why they do it. And in the process, um, so yeah, it, it is as, um, they may have revived it uh, 20 years ago, but it's certainly it's certainly an old uh, practice. Even with us, the kukinis, the kukini of the um, of, of ancient times were those, um, were, were also have, ha also having ali'i status, had a chiefly status about, um, and title about them, but their job, was and and their uh, practice was to run the length and the um the width of their mokus from one to the next and the beautiful part about that was that each of the kuhinis made a per of uh, developed a personal and, and um intimate relationship with each ali kaukau ali or lesser chief within each um given ahupua or moku or district and this is not un, this is not dissimilar with what he's describing um, our our Native American First Nations um, brothers and sisters did, and the relation the nature of this of this practice of ritual running and being being forced into um, uh, micro communities and 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 learning each other's names and building relationships that last years. So this is an old practice. So yeah, the, the concept of ceremonial running is, is very ancient. But when it came to this particular ceremony, using or applying the practice of ceremonial running to this of this ancestral, it was new. That was a new ceremony using this, as they refer to this medicine. And so to, to speak a little in depth of my experience of why I kept coming back for this, was I, that first year of the ancestral run that I got to run, I really had found and related to this, this concept of ceremonial running. Because I experienced something that I've only experienced in my ritual, hula. And that is physical exertion that gets you to the point to lele, to transcend. transcend. It's that wall, that wall of exhaustion you feel, whether it's through your day or maybe you, you, your physical or sports. For those of you who have engaged in sports, that's, they all, all of these rituals are to facilitate that lele, that transcendence, yeah. to exhaust the physical body and your mind chatter, so that all that's left to all that's left to operate is spirit and conviction. Past the pain, past the exhaustion. So, as on Kanaka up there, that first, you know, I'm the normal kind. I run 
la raised hand. The slipper come off and we run la raised. So even on Israel, you know, then it was like, oh, get the Hawaiians, they're running without shoes on their feet. That was always one big thing. But I had an incident when I got dropped off at one point. I guess where I was way up in the front and, you know, cars weren't coming, picking up, or people were hanging out later or something. But I got dropped off I was the end of the line. I didn't know I was the end of the line. And then somehow the staff got to me already. So I got it and I started going. And I kept going. And I kept going. I never come up to another person. I was like, where the hell is the next person? I remember getting to that point, but it's like the whole thing is that the staff cannot stop. It's like one of the things they say, yeah? So I'm like, oh my God, I'm carrying these people's staff. I cannot stop this prayer. I don't like be that person that messes up the ceremony because I would stop because I'm tired. I just kept going. I was like, oh my God. I'm, I don't know if I took the wrong road. I don't remember seeing another road, but I was just going. And nobody was ahead. But soon, I, you know, you ever ran so much or exercise or whatever so much that, you know, your ears get plugged, you get that pressure, and all you do is you can hear your own breath in your head, and you can swear you can hear your heartbeat in your throat? I remember getting into that. Just this morning. <laughs> On the way to the bathroom. <laughs> but getting to that point, it was almost like everything else shut down. My brain wasn't, I got beyond the, oh my God, where am I? Oh my God, I'm a freaking bear, go chase me down. I got past that, and I was just in this rhythm of my breath, my feet, and my heart. And everything was just rolling. That's the Buddha. There, I, I like broke into that. And then, all, sometime later, I don't know how much longer it was, all of a sudden, one big truck of natives will come, oh, bro, we didn't know where you were. We were back, back over there checking for you. Some, they just got messed up somehow in the transition or whatever, but they were coming up behind and they never see me, so they thought they passed me, so they would turn around and go back, but I was already past them. I had run seven miles. And they were all freaking out. They thought they lost that Hawaiian boy with the staff. But they found me way up there. Like I said, I'm not one Rana. So that was already something that I was like, whoa, I ran that far. I don't know I don't know what happened that. Because you know what? I wasn't running in my mortal anymore. My body was floating. It was in some other thing, other realm. So that's where I had my whoa. Okay, this is something else. It's not just a relay run. You know, if you're growing up over here, you know, we know Iron Man, yeah. So we just think, yeah, it's okay. It's big sport. But this one broke through for me, so I really had this powerful experience, and that's why I was like grateful to like to share this. So now again, fast forward, 2013. I hear the story that, and they're sharing like, yeah, you know, Uncle Randy was saying, yeah, it's only been a little over 20 years now that we've been doing this. I was like, oh, that means I've already been here for 10 years. That means when I first came, it was only like 10 years old. And he was sharing the story. You know, there are people up there now. Now I know we've had rough times as Kanaka, but you know what? Compare that history to what happened oh. to the California Indians. They were hunted down. The state of California, up into even almost the 1920s, put out a bounty. They were they were natives. paying people to bring in Indian heads. We got paid a head. five dollars, oh, two dollars for if you brought aloha. in babies' heads. Mahalo, aloha, five dollars if you brought in a woman's head. Twenty dollars if you brought in a brave. You know. As the, as the colonizers swept across the continent of Mokuhonu, especially the, the Great Plains people really gave them a, a run for their money. <laughs> By the time they moved beyond that, they were like, you know what, we don't like to deal with these people, just kill them. That is what happened. The California gold rush, a big part of that whole thing was to encourage more people up there to kill the Indians. To suss them. And oh, yeah, thank you. The, and then was born the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. These people were an integral part of the natural ecosystem of that area. You know, they've been there from the receding of the ice in the Ice Age. They have been there for those many thousands of years. So to every one of them that you meet, that's an endangered species. An integral part to that ecosystem. But they were systematically and, systematically. Um, and genocidally. Um, Lights out. So we okay, Kanakas. We, we're in a good place, honestly. We're in the place that we need to be at this point. But you know, in 
this day and age too, they still suffer a lot of the same plagues that we hear in our community. They were saying, you know, at that time, you know, they had a lot of drug, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, all these things. Coping yeah, mechanisms for poverty. that trauma. Yeah. yeah. Coping mechanisms for Sound that trauma. Sound familiar? Sound yeah. familiar. Um, and the elders of the tribe said, we need to do something for our people. We need a prayer. And Uncle Randy was saying, like, yeah, they're pretty gruff and right to it. He said, the elders called him and said, here, take the prayer. We we'll give the prayers of, at Mount Shasta to fire and then carry that prayer to teach them. And they notice the disconnect of tribes and co tribal communities, mm -hmm. rancherias or more, more, um, which are similar to Kuleana, to Kuleana lands, um, where a specific Ohana-based and community, uh, a smaller community-based um, piece of uh, uh, ili of the aina or um, section of land is cared for by that specific, usually a family or two or three that makes up those rancherias. So this, this, it started off really rough, like Uncle Riley said, like they, they just gave a simple instruction. Take the prayer from that mountain to that mountain. Go. Figure it out. And he was telling us how it was quite an experience, like, you know, it was just him and a couple other guys and they went, this did their, as they know, their regular simple ritual of you no, know, making the fire, offering some prayers and some tobacco, and they didn't quite know where they're gonna run. So they started the next day, and they started the, their little relay, and they got lost a bunch of times. They realized, you know, soda is not the best thing to have on this. Water is a pretty good thing to have. They grabbed a couple other guys along the way, and it took them a, a, a few days, but eventually they made it. And, and along the way, being asked by their people, "Oh, what are you doing?" Or even some of their, even their own people, "Ah, why are you guys doing that?" Sound familiar? <laughs> you know, I like to say this thing, and I think it's it's funny, but it's not. I said, from the cave to the conference room, the male species has not evolved. But more to the point, to clarify, the philosophy behind that is that a good portion um, of our incarcerated and and um, addicted uh, um, communities uh, are kane. Arkani Hawaii, or indigenous men, nay, endemic men, excuse me, I want to start using that word again. Endemic men. And so, the point of my cave to the conference room um, response is that the hunter gatherer hasn't le left you. Is that from the cave to the conference room, the continuity of your, as, as far as your genetic or um, your your latent memories and your ancestral memories are still active. The hunter-gatherer has not left you. And what happens is that when you put a hunter-gatherer, you pluck him out of his environment, his or her environment, and you place him in, a, in in four walls. How else is a how else is um, uh, an endemic animal supposed to react and so all of the, that hunter gatherer energy and that mana hasn't left you and it needed it needs a channel it needs some kind of outlet in which to in which to express itself specifically to the aina and then when your men when when our uh, the community when our community's men don't have an outlet because so much of our so much of the identity of men is based on and defined by his role in his community, his role in his society. Society determines the worth and the contributions and the value of a colony. When you don't have those rites of passages and these rituals in place in, for those outlets, then they have to manifest somehow. So then addiction occurs, substance abuse occurs, addiction occurs, oh, gambling happens. They're gonna find someplace else. And this run, this, um, this ancestral run, or the running, of, um, running for the uh, unity of spirit and Aina um, gave birth to what is now um, what Ranakila folks had established as the Lonoi Kamakaiki um, uh, run for 
um, law enforcement piece and unity. Yeah. So after hearing this story from Uncle Radley of how it started, as something as simple as that, you know, they were being told by many people, like, you know, what's doing? But then the next year, the elders told them to do it again. And more people joined them. And the next year, more people joined. And then more people joined. So it built up to a whole big thing that many of the whole tribe come out for. And other rituals and ceremonies began to come to it. Sounds similar. See it? See it? And it grew into this monumental thing. So after hearing that, my big, that's when I realized, you know what? That is a living culture. A living culture that we can, they, they created a ceremony in this day and age, tethered to ritual <laughs> concepts of their ancestors, but created a new ceremony. They have that right. So I realize we have that right. We are not bound only what's in a history book. We are not bound by linear interpretations of culture. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not point A to Z. That's not how. That's not how the indigenous or the endemic. Um, native mind works. Everything is completely cyclical. You think you just you, for for a, a very plain example of that is your genealogy. You are half of your mother and your father and their mother and their fathers and their mother and their fathers. Essentially you're them. And we keep reinforcing that same um, that same para, uh, intersection, not parallel, if the intersection of philosophy with the Mahona. Because to, to be able to deconstruct that linear, Western linear of approach to culture, to a living culture, and instead restore that idea of, that, of a cyclical um, culture. If I'm saying I am my mother and I am my grandmother and I am my grandmother's mother, then by virtue and by, by right, by birthright, I have there. I too have access to those privileges of ceremony and ritual, and to invoke those privileges of ceremony and ritual. It's exactly what we're experiencing. I'm not the echo of. I am. Aloha lani. saying what I teach my students is that everything that we consider a tradition was once an innovation and the way that an innovation a new practice um, becomes a tradition is when the community finds it valuable and then passes it on over the generations and what settlers Westerners don't understand is that even their own religions and practices were once innovations but they deny us that and that's part of authenticity discourse, which is always problematic. Christianity itself is only about 2,000 years old and was once a new religion and was persecuted for being such, but it is rooted in the older tradition, which is Abrahamic. Even our own culture, we have a history of that. What do you think about our culture? We have no origin story about why chaos. That was an innovation. Yes. Exactly. So to own. The fact that we are our living ancestors. Authenticity discourse, I love that nomenclature. And so the fact that we can conjure, we can call, we can create, as as I learned in this experience with the Pit River Nation, being able to create a ceremony to address the conditions of their community in the now. The circumstances of their era, of their time. And that's all we really can do. And as our ancestors had done before us, all they were doing was finding and facilitating these spaces and um, these spaces and, and um, seasonal rituals with respect and relevance to the circumstances of their environment for their particular time. Whether or not it was for a foreshadowing of their of their progeny of their of their um, descendants or for the benefit of was in the point. 
their culture and their their ritual their um, spiritual um, development and evolution was happening in real time and it needed to be acknowledged in real time so at the end of that that run uh, that um, in 2013 I really connected and as they refer to it as the medicine so I, I, I went to the sacred fire that last night and I asked them, I said, you know, this has been so impactful for me over all these years coming here that could I share this medicine with my people? And they all were, yes, please do. And so I came home and I'm going to make Maka Sacred Facebook. I have an idea. I had this and stuff. Anybody interested, let's have a halabai. Yeah, and so people came together, we began these conversations, and of course I took it to my kumus, I took it to kupuna, this idea of running, and I remember my best conversation actually was with Mama, with Antiki Kuhi and, and with Tangaro, um, and I shared with them my experience of feeling this, this similarity, you know, and that I come from the same lineage of hula, that's where I felt this realm of this puka, this, that same feeling that I feel in the ritual hula, I felt it in this running. And I remember them sharing like, no, this is good, you know, because we are we do adapt. We do also integrate in our culture. We all have the ukulele, yeah? Is that a Hawaiian? It wasn't. It is now. Lomi lomi salmon. We had tomatoes. Did we have salmon? We do now. Yeah. It's just some real basic things, yeah. But in that, you know, our culture evolves and has got, we we are allowed. To evolve. Thank you. That's part of the authenticity discourse. So, is it real? Authentic discourse is part of that. Is de deprogramming our own insecurity and discourse with respect right. to that, our reception of that. Because the problem we get most of that is from our own people. Why are you guys making like that again? Who's spooky? You know, that's not porno. That's where the problem is. A lot of the problem is convincing you guys to to adhere to and respond to and resonate with your authenticity and sometimes allowing yourself to be Hawaii and allowing yourself to operate in the mode of that ancestral memory rather than rather than um, rather than continuing with that authenticity discourse within you. You were born Hawaii. You were taught to be this. Whatever you think you are right now and today at this moment, whatever iteration of, of life we think we're at, titles you hold, you were taught to be this way. And whatever can be taught can be unlearned. But you were born what, who you are. There's a difference. I so when I, uh, after some time uh, and analyzing these things and trying to create, what, what would the ceremony look like in Hawaii? Because I remember what the Antiki Koi said right now, said, oh, that, that's my kai, but remember, we're not, we're not Native Americans. If you're going to bring this medicine, you have to make it us. So the concept of running, where did we, so just kind of analyze it, basic, where did we have running in our culture? Kukini. Yeah. The kukini, the messenger runners, the chiefs, yeah? those who did their, all the kukini. Okay, so that's our term. We're kukini. Is there, uh, was there ritual and ceremony of running? Nothing that we know of as of right now, but if we had kukini, I'm damn sure they probably had their own rituals for themselves. Yes. On the sense of how to run, if that was their practice, then there's most likely ceremony to that. The running is just an, iter an iteration of this, of this physical exertion. Then you have all of the Wakahiki games, you even have Lua, you have Kula. Mm -hmm. So with that, too, the, we began to ask, you know, what's the intention of the prayer? And my, my first thing was, well, we need to get our communities and our people more, even more conscious and focused that we need to take care of our Aina. Yeah. So it became a prayer for the Aina and for the consciousness of Kanaka. So we call it the Ahapule Aina, the Ahapule Aina Hol. This ceremonial running prayer for the land. Okay. Of course, they got bashed left and right by said, Oh, that doesn't make any sense. Da, 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 da. <laughs> From, <laughs> From our own people. people. From our own people. Yeah. But they say, you know, that's what we're going to do. Where do we run? We were first thinking, all right, all kind of crazy ideas. We went from this side, from Kumukahi to Keahole. Oh, no, maybe we're going to run up the mountain. Or... Then we think, okay, where is the, the trek? 
Yep. Or what is an energy that comes to the idea of healing of Aina? No, no. No, no. That's the essence of what makahiki is. Makahiki, the essence of makahiki is not play games. No. Your restoration. It's about restoration, restore, re restoring. The coming of the Lono, the Lono weather patterns is all about restoring and restocking. Yeah? Why did we, during that time, we didn't hakaka, we had no war, we didn't, um, we didn't do the hard laborious work because you got to let the land work rest. You need to rest. The Kanaka need to rest. So it's about rest and rejuvenation, and restoration. Yeah? So Lono became the Akua that we tethered and connected with. When do we honor him? Where do we see his arrival? The, the concept of all these lono elements. Lono, both the elemental and the deified. We I, have very two, very, very two distinct um, categories of of akua or um, or divinity. We have those whom are elemental and are the kanis of the in the water and the peles of terra firma, so on and so forth. And then you have the deified ones. Those ali'i, chiefs, priests, warriors, heroes, that became deified because of their deeds and their contributions to their community and to their people. And lo both aspects of Lono was, a, a, was in perfect alignment with this movement, with the Ahaholo, Ahapuliholo. And because on the one hand you have the lonos, um, you have the lonos of the elementals, which are which is typically the lono season, but also lono ikamakahiki, whom also circumnavigated every part of every moku on the entire pai aina, and who established the restrictions of um, of the activities of man during that period. So that that gave us our route. With the connection to Lono, the na circumnavigating the islands, that gave us our route. Said, oh, okay, we'll run the, around the whole island. <laughs> you know, that was 270 something miles. We'll find that out later. But um, well, that gave us our route. Where are we going to start? Some people said, oh, well, the traditional um, procession of the high chiefs and everything began down at Hikiao Heiau. I was like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not chief and I'm not Kaguna. And it's 2019. So I said, we go start from Honoka'a. Of course, after when I got back, why are you guys just starting Honoka'a? It's like, why not? How come I can't start from my town? Why? What's wrong with my town? What are you saying for me? Yeah. And that, that's where it's being birthed from. So we began. And actually, it, it took another step. So we began to prepare for this. And um, one thing we did, we, we, we needed a, we, we were going to adopt this concept of the prayer staff. And so I asked uh, one of my uncles, Uncle Kanani Kaulu Kukui, to carve us a, 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 a prayer staff connecting us to Lono. And so he carved the staff, um, it's just about this tall, it's like a small baton. Um, and this is now, this was the first ki'i that I was given kuleana with. The name of this ki'i ki is Lono Kikukini Pule. Lono of the prayer runners. And at this time, of course, Mauna Kea is in movement and stuff too. So that's a big concept of one of the things that we're trying to pray for, for the protection of Aina. And the concept then rose from sharing with others in our community. Let's take our prayer. Let's start this prayer from the highest. So we set the ritual. We gathered here. Um, this is before. This is before Mauna Kea movement. It's before all that, before the groundbreaking. Um, we met up there at, at the uh, Poha, uh, Haripohaku area for sunrise. And that is where we officially began our makahiki with that sunrise. Well, we're not makahiki actually, just the awakening of this staff. And then we went up to the nu'u, to the summit, so that the prayer for the healing of the land begins at the highest point of Hawaii. And then the Lono staff, we hiked it into Lake Waiau, and the first Hibu Vai of the staff took place in at Lake Waiau. And then he is adorned with the kappa. Not to mention our kappa makers jumped in to make the kappa. So this, the kappa that you see on the Lono is real kappa. We make a new kappa every year. Guess where um, that idea came from? White kappa. You see that the traditional big Lono, Lono Makua, the big traditional banner of old, yeah, or, um, Akua Loa, 
and then they carry during the procession time. So we're mirroring some a lot of these images. But in no way are we trying to replace. This was not meant to be the procession of the high chief. We're not trying no. to recreate that. We're not trying to take the face off. Nor are, nor are we trying to revive them. No. This is not that attempt of a of revival of that. And of course, we got bashed for that too. Some doctors out there. This stuff is just saying, like, oh, oh, you know, only the high priests are allowed to touch the lotus, lo, the akua loa. That is like, does this look like the akua loa? It's not the akua loa. We're not trying to say this is the akua loa. Yeah. Only the high, what high priests have we seen lately doing? Because if they're out there, I wonder how come we're not doing it then. Our spiritual practices should reflect the circumstances of said community, of said kanaka circumstances. Right. Your ritual should reflect the needs of you, your ohana, and your community in that space, in that time. Right. Simple. So from the highest point of the mauna, where we are facing you know, some issues for aina, then we come down and we go out way out here. We take the Mauna Loa Access Road and it's a, if you look at a picture of Hawaii Moku, and you put your finger in the middle, that's where we go. Way out there is a place called Pu'u, Pu'u Kole. Some of us call it Pu'u Kohe. And at that Pu'u out there, that's where we do the, uh, the next prayer. And there is an Ahu, a very ancient, old Ahu. We don't really know its function. But that's where we give our, we, we offer Pule there. So it begins from the highest point of Hawaii Island to the center point of Hawaii Island. And then we end that day back in Hamakua, and we begin with feasts. It's Makahiki. It's a lot. No, we got a feast. Um, and then with sunrise ceremony the next day, we begin our run. And from the very first year in 2014, November 2014 is when we actually began this the very first ceremony. Um, oh, oh, we that. Um, we made sure to invite our ohana from the Mokuhonu, from the Pit River Nation, those who inspired this and, and gifted us this, this medicine. And they came. They came. I think about 30 of them. And they brought their dancers. They brought their prayer songs with us. And back then, this is, we're still fresh. We actually met in my backyard. We had our first big feast in Honoka. <laughs> Everybody came in and we exchanged pule, ho'okupu, makana. And at sunrise, at Honokha Park, the poo sound in the night. Pabu sound, we gave up pule. As soon, for us in our protocol there, as soon we pull it all the way, the last prayer is Eala E. Because once the sun pukas, run. the staff begins. The run begins. And we begin from Honokha'a. In our first day, and then what we did for also galvanizing for this is we went all the way around the Moku and we shared with all these other communities. So people were preparing for the arrival of the Lono runners all the way around and preparing their runners. We went around and shared for everybody. We created this in a way, just like we're seeing here, to be inclusive. Just be Pono and you can hop by this staff. You can carry the staff, even if you can only carry it 10 feet. My kai. Thing is, once we begin at run, Lono, that, that, that Lono Kukini Pule, the staff can only move by the power of the people. It will enter no vehicle. So it will make its entire trek hand to hand, all the way through. And our first day is from Honoka'a to Uwe Kahuna at Kilauea. Yeah, 76 miles. Yeah. Most beautiful thing, Laupo Hoi Hoi Elementary School heard about this. We were coming to Laupo Hoi Hoi, Laupo Hoi Train Museum. We came around the corner, fourth graders all lined up. And we passed them the stuff. They were like, what? Yeah, and they just went this. But they all went touch them, and then poof, kept going from there. We had people pulling on the side of the road and just for chant us by. Some people pull us out for chant that's why we give them the stuff like, what? And they just run a little bit and they walk back to the car. Everyone can be can participate. Everyone can feel part of that aloha. It's a simple form where everyone can now step into this realm of ritual and it's okay. 
It's okay. Yeah. We have those of us, and some of us who are dedicated to do the entire run. Normally, it's about thirty or thirty to sixty of us every that will go the whole four days. Um, and we have runners coming in from all over. And we run and we get to Kilauea. We actually stop at Hilo for lunch. Normally every year the Royal Order is there to receive us at Kamehameha Statue. Fresh runners, thank God. <laughs> they pick them up and they keep going. Some of us can get some lunch. We go up, we meet them, we continue this, care of this leapfrog all the way through. And as we stand, the same thing like we adopted, we drop everybody off an integral. So you see, during that run, you will see Kanaka randomly all over the road. Then we said, oh, we got to wait a long time, so everyone get their signs now. Aloha aina. Yeah? Lonoi kamakahiki. You hear the calls, you hear the chant, people on the side just chanting, pulling. Yeah? Or just spending time with each other. Connecting and people from around, from all over. From other islands, from just different districts. You get to tell a story with them. You become kamaaina, kuaaina. And we run, the second day begins at uh, Kilauea, which we acknowledge, of course, another lono. Lono maakua. The creator of the, of the keeper of the fire sticks that birthed the fires of the of Kilauea. And we from second day we went from there, we went all the way down Kau, Ora Ohana down Na Alehu. And um actually uh at um Waiwahino, they always get lunch over there and fresh runners. Thank God. And they keep on going. And we end the second day running all the way down to Miloli. Literally, you're always ready. That's like a new thing. Everybody is like, they go, you're going to run all the way down this year. You're going to run all the way down this year. Good luck on your knees. I beat you at the bottom. <laughs> and we bring them into the village. That whole village is pumped up every year to welcome the Lomo. Third day begins. Now, we know it came out of a, out of a logistical thing because, you know, the road from Niroli to Kona is like huh? dangerous. So it began out of a log logistical thing, but just so happened our very first year, Middle East had just received a couple months before, they got their racing cameras. And they're like, we go paddle them. So the third day begins with a 22 mile paddle from Middle East to Kiala Kikua. And over the years, as we began from, Kiala, uh, from Middle East, we sent them out. Some like they have several canoes. And as we go along, the other villages, Ho'okena sends out canoes. We come into um, Pu'uhonua Ho now now. There, normally, there's protocol at Haleo Keawe, and then they also send out canoes. And we all go ahead to Hikiao and Kiala Kikua, and you see this fleet of canoes come in. And they bring the staff back ashore, and it goes to Hikiao. And actually, over the years, the Mo'olonos of, of Hikiao Heiau, where it's the traditional uh, procession of Ali'i of Makahiki, began from that Heiau. So very significant. We not Paoro, we get from there, and then our day does not end till Pu'ukohola and Kawai Hai. So from Meloli'i all the way to Kawai Hai. And there we're greeted by Oda Kohala Ohana. And we do ceremonies and prayers there. We begin the, the fourth day, the final day, at the foot below Pu'ukohola. We lay always a ho'okupu of a piece of white kapa upon the lele. Yeah. And then we begin from there. We push off and we go all the way up to Kapa'au. Actually, we end at the Kamehameha statue there. And then we come down Kohala Mountain Road to Waimea. And all along the way, people are set up. People are, are engaged and ready to run. Why may I? They get up because I think we case over there. Yeah? So all the schools, HPA is ready, right? When we get to the bottom of the hill, for pick them up. Kano Kaina is always enforced. The Parker School is there ready for run. All the uh, Why may I Country School, or Punana Leo, our kinkies, they're always in the back. We go to true Hawaiian homes because we got to wake up Hawaiians. Yeah? We bring them true Hawaiian homes. And then we come out, and then we go all the way out, and we go down Mud Lane, so we get no Mud Lane. That's a long trek. That's another one. Like, you do Mud Lane. That's six miles with no vehicle support. You got to get all the way through. Good luck. We give them four wheelers that are going to go with for safety. But then they come out, and we, we go to Waipi or Lookout. We go for a pull it there, and it's the last 10 mile stretch back to Honoka. And we complete the, our ceremony. But that whole way, just pumping everybody up. And actually, we do, we've said this, that we are doing this. It's a little bit, we set this time to be a little bit before the rising of the Makali'i. As part of this, Koleana said, Kukini, the messenger, is to, to bring conscious to the people. The run is to herald the coming of Makahiki, the coming of the Lono. Now, sorry, i got to wrap this up. Um, my final thing to this, too. 
This will be our seventh year. This coming November. This will be the second week of November. It is actually for six days of ceremony. The first days begin when we do the protocols here on the Mauna in the middle, and we end with actually Kapukai down in Kawaihai. The second day is preparations, and then the first communal feast in Hamakua. And then it's four days of Latin. Um, but what has kept me going, and after the fourth year was my dedication that I have to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and we got bashed left and right by Kanaka and others, you know, mostly citing historical whatevers. But you know what? And especially like for both their stuff on Facebook, yeah? <laughs> we can read too, you know. Yeah. We know history well. Yeah. Been there. We're so informed. I what, read that same book. What, I what know. else you yeah. got? What else you got? But also what I saw was beautiful. You know, some people was attacking us on Facebook. I never need to say nothing. The people, the community that engaged, they engaged and said, you know what? You know what? That might be, you know, historically, whatever that you're saying, that might be correct. But you know what? I felt something in that. It sparked me to do something. Now, our first run was 2014. March 2015. Four o'clock in the morning, I get a call. Machines are moving on this mountain. I would put out the call, we have to do something. That's when I got here, was stopped at the bottom, and I said, I don't care, I'm going. And I would climb from this bottom of the mountain up to 12,000 feet, chasing the machines. And I put those little messages out there. And when they finally opened up the road down below, the first people who came to the mountain were runners. The first, for the first few days, where, where most people don't even know that all this took place, was all Kukini runners. Because how can you go and run the whole island and dedicate all that mana to pray for the land and then not do nothing when action happens? They're like, I don't already run my ass or I don't even run like hell for praying for this mana. How am I going to sit back and do nothing? That's the Lono. Well, Lono. Activate us. Lono is the activator. Lono is the resonant between is that inkling in your na'au that's telling you, I need to be here. I felt something. I don't care what your historical reference is. I don't care what your socio-political associations are. I felt something. That's the lono. And that was, and it served its function. The lonoa. For all of your multiple, the multi-sensory experience that you get, that transcendent experience through this ritual, and activated people in such a way that was the was the catalyst for this. This is why we you, ran. You guys are in iteration or a continuation, a continuum of that lono. And why you have to continue? Do we pray it again? To pray for the health of land and the consciousness of the people to act to help to save the Aina. To act in alignment with the Aina. Now, I gotta close with this. Now, all that aside of what we felt as people and what you know other people's perspectives and everything, the final straw for me that was like, this is happening. Something that I've always had on to the Antike Kuhi, I remember telling us a long time ago. When we chant, when you pull it, and then you see a reaction, that's magic. That is your magic. And don't ever let that concept, that foreign concept that they love to shove down our trolley. Oh, it's just, oh, oh, I forgot the word because I tried to do this. It's just coincidence. That is to break ourselves of owning our magic. So when we ran in that first year, Again, so a lot of these guys from Big River Country, the main community they all come from is Redding, California. They all live Redding. Um, it was the third day of their run. We were coming down along the bottom over here, a little bit past Hilton area. And I saw them all congregate, uh, congregating on the side. And they were all like running around with their phones. I thought, oh crap, something's wrong. They pulled over. Like, you guys okay? Like, look at this, look at this. 
they were all like some of them was crying and everything because 2014 what was happening in california what's the biggest thing we heard about drought, drought. total drought yeah they showed us on up their phones their family were sending them messages a text was saying whatever you guys doing now over there keep doing it front page of the reading newspaper pineapple express storm I kid you not, the satellite images show this whole system coming down the Hawaiian Islands to Kumukahi and shooting straight out across directly into Redding. It was pouring in Redding. I don't care what you say. That's a sign. That is a whole Ilona. These people gave up their medicine to our people. The first time we they come here and they run in prayer for us, our Hawaii sent a gift to them, direct. And in following years too, there we've had years where we are running and we have this massive cloud in tow. All the way around, it's like we stop too long, the rain catch up. We run some more and it's just right behind us. <laughs> two years ago, also a good motivator. two years ago was nuts. We were coming along the bottom here, again, that same stretch. Everyone's waiting for us to pull kola. I hear one text, bro, are you guys coming on the stretch right now? He was like, yeah. It's like, we see you guys. The biggest, craziest lightning storm was going on right above us. Thunder was crackling. Lightning bolts were coming. It was getting kind of scared, like, oh, crap. But at the same time, we couldn't. We're praying for Lord. That's Lono. We're all like, the thunder goes, we go, oh, I my ear, Lono. That was it. And we literally told this storm. Means no, no, envelop me. It was just like, yeah. I mean, literally, we had, had static. Our hair was going up. That's the kind of lightning storm we were running in. But we did not fear it. But when your God is the rain and the storm, you have no fear of it. I run with them. We are them. We had similarly done uh, in um, my uncle, um, my uncle Parley and grandmother folks had um, had talked to the, um, some of the PKO guys and had started what was going to, what would have eventually evolved into a ka'apuni. We took a koa canoe around every island in this archipelago and paddled around it. Mm. And around, around the same time, about 1999 to going into 2000, we did Hawaii Island. It took us three weeks. Because, <laughs> you know, the ocean, not, the ocean not like the pavement, huh? yeah. no stay. But the Ka'apuni served the same purpose. It was the laborious sacrifice of sweat and purpose and intuition and ancestral memory and necessity and cause I felt something that forced us to, to compelled us to be able to complete this. And that's the essence of the Kukini is to establish and reestablish community. Kini means kini or lau or mano means the masses, means us, inclusive of. And the ku, the, the ku prefix is exactly that, the establishment of. And you have to re-establish the idea. And so what they did, the precedent that the, the Pule Aha Aina Holo did, the precedent that it set was a reshifting of of um, mentality and designating the aina as the ali'i. So all those people, um, all those keyboard stroke warriors going on and on from our own community, feeding us that negativity and those comments, that's your answer. You want to know where, which ali'i we going? The aina, how's that? Naf kanaka ali'is, naf. We've had enough of us. The aina is the ali'i. We are in service of it. And that reminded the co community and that set a precedent to shift our notion of value and how we value ourselves to what would have eventually been become this movement here. Girl, I just have a poof. Kukini, the rising multitudes. <laughs> Hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, we late. <laughs> okay. 
But in that, um, after, what time is the second round? We have another, we're going to be continuing this into a little more descriptive of what, how that is, how this rituals have been in pain here and, gov and continue to govern our movement back toward Aina. Uh, it's going to continue in the next session after protocol. So, mahala nui kapo.